government acted quickly by employing high-handed measures to nip this problem in the bud and avoid taking responsibility. When the government decide to um, establish, to form a detention facility and to put and to legislate a law that can uh, detain the refugees, the asylum seekers in a, a detention facility in the middle of the desert for three years without any trial, without any uh, procedures, just putting them there for three years. And the purpose of it was to just, you know, m make them life miserable and make them live uh, by, them, by themselves. And we started to struggle against that uh, infiltrator's laws. Uh, there were appeals by the uh, um, human rights organization to the Supreme Court uh, to cancel the law. And we fought against it in the Knesset, against the legislation. And at the end, uh, the Supreme Court uh, three times or three times canceled the, uh, the law of infiltrators and uh, told the government you cannot put people in prison for three years without any trial and all their, you know, all their uh, crime is uh, trying to get a better life for themselves. Meantime, the media was awash with reports about the secret arrangement to have the asylum seekers relocated to a third country. Rwanda and Uganda were mentioned as destination countries, allegations which Uganda government vehemently denied. That is not true. That is uh, unfounded uh, uh, information and we, we do not know where it originated from. I'd like to make it very clear today, for the record, that we have no written, verbal or any form of agreement with Israel to host refugees who are rejected, deported or fled Israel to come to Uganda. The matter was brought before the parliament of Uganda by members from the opposition who sought government's clarification. This mounted additional pressure on government to make the process more transparent. The media reports that Israel was proposing to send the refugees to Uganda and Rwanda and it will meet some costs. The cost they are going to meet was unclear whether it was going to be cost of transportation, whether it was going to be the cost uh, of hosting these people where they were sending them. In fact, for me at the beginning, that was the issue I raised in the parliament. I was concerned because, you see, uh, the government as an institution, every single shilling that is given to the Ghanaian government must be declared. So I wanted to ask them to explain, what, first of all, if you are going to receive these people, two, if Israel is going to give us money, where is the money, and what arrangement do we get that money? So at the beginning, that was my, my question. I actually thought that government was in, in some sort of negotiation with Israel. But when the reports appeared in the media, they denied that these people are here. When I raised it in parliament, they denied. As the pressure continued to mount, the government of Uganda reinstated their earlier position. The minister in charge of disaster preparedness addressed the press conference admitting an arrangement with the state of Israel to relocate and process asylum seekers to Uganda. Above the state of Israel, working with other refugee managing organizations, has requested Uganda to allow about 500 refugees of Eritrean and Sudanese descent origin to be relocated to Uganda. I want to make it abundantly clear that the government and my ministry are positively considering this request. And it's important to note that all the relocatees <coughs> shall have to undergo a rigorous verification process under what we call a refugee eligibility assessment to find their status so that they can be granted asylum in our country. But he insisted that the relocation process was yet to start and no funds have been paid to the government of Uganda. Already we have 1.4 million refugees here in Uganda. We have not been paid a cent. In fact, it is us spending our limited resources to make sure that we make them have a second home here in Uganda. So there is no payment attached to this. It is purely humanitarian. 
the eligibility committee is standing by just to receive the first batch and we'll make it public. When they come, you'll we'll see them and we'll process them through the assessment and those who will meet our criteria will certainly be granted asylum immediately. Under the shadows, a number of asylum seekers who fled richly to seek asylum in Israel are being brought to Uganda under circumstances akin to human trafficking. Once they arrive in Uganda, they are unable to claim refugee status due to the manner in which they are relocated. at one of the government's weekly meetings in Jerusalem, Benjamin Netanyahu briefed his cabinet that the refugees who he referred to as infiltrators were already being shipped out of Israel. Though Uganda has a favorable refugee policy, taking in the bark of refugees from its volatile neighboring countries, totaling close to 1.5 million fleeing conflicts in Congo, Burundi, Somalia and South Sudan, to attain refugee status in Uganda, one has to be subjected to verification process, a procedure that is done in conjunction with the UN bodies dealing with refugee affairs like the UNHCR. Those who come to the country under unclear circumstances are unlikely to meet the eligibility criteria. All those who gain access to the country through forests, through lakes, once found, they are subjected to the law. They are treated as illegal immigrants and as such prosecuted. The Eritrean community in Uganda has formed a lobby organization to present the issue of Eritrean relocated to Uganda under the cover of darkness to the government of Uganda. They hope that lobbying through a joint effort may get the attention of government officials and change the fate of their colleagues brought to Uganda under illegal circumstances. The legal dilemma when they are put here, they are neither migrants nor refugee, so they are stateless legally. They are stateless. They don't have a document to say that they are, or they are, although they are origin Eritrean or South Sudanese or Sudanese, they don't have the document to show that they are from this country. It's only their physic, physically, okay, or their language. Legally, how would the government of Uganda accept them as refugee or asylum seeker? Human rights lawyer Laudislaus Rakafuzi has taken interest in the issue. He oversees his attempts to offer pro bono legal services to one of these deported asylum seekers have been frustrated. I need, what I had planned to do is to seek a declaration that these people are refugees here and they should be protected with some aid. They should be given settlement, some land, some food and that kind of thing. That's what I wanted to do. But this person eluded me and many I others have, have, the helped, have all eluded me. I've broken my hand. The International Organization for Migration, IOM, office in Uganda, the UN body mandated to do third party relocation of refugees has not been approached not to address the issue. Uh, in many countries when the government has, uh, has, uh, uh, is faced with a situation like this or is undertaking repatriation of some form, they do, again, uh, they do request uh, IOM or other, other, other partners to, uh, to assist. In this particular case, IOM has not been, we've not been asked to. So at this particular case, the, the, the information we have is quite scant. It's only what we've seen in the media. 
and what we've, uh, uh, what we've seen and the statements that the government has issued. Say, say no to deportation. Persistent protests in Israel by Eritrean and South Sudanese asylum seekers with the support of Israel community opposed the deportation kept the issue of repatriation in the limelight. An anti-deportation rally held in Tel Aviv drew a crowd of over 20,000 people. At the same time, there is an ongoing court battle to overturn the decision to deport refugees to countries already saddled with low incomes, while overflowing with refugees from conflict-prone regions. In addition, questions about whether third-party countries are accepting money in exchange for the transfer have also not gone away. On March 12, 2018, the Israel High Court of Justice temporarily froze the deportation and ordered the government to address some of the legal issues surrounding its expulsion policy. In March 2018, the Rosa Luxembourg Stiftung facilitated a fact-finding delegation from Israel that comprised two Israel parliamentarians and representatives of legal organizations to Rwanda and Uganda on a mission to gather information about the situation of refugees who are allegedly deported to the third countries by the Israel government. Their fact-finding mission was to verify the conditions under which asylum seekers were being relocated, confirmed that indeed Eritreans and South Sudanese were already being deported to the region illegally. We felt that the government is not telling us the truth. We felt that the government not only not telling us as member of parliament, but they are not telling the Supreme Court the truth. We knew that there was some kind of secret agreement with Rwanda government because Netanyahu just told everyone in a press conference that Rwanda is one of the country that we are going to deport by force people. We don't need the agreement of the um, asylum seeker, we just want to deport them. And we knew that they provide for the Supreme Court some kind of an agreement that the Supreme Court said, if that's the agreement, so we will approve it. And we couldn't see that agreement and we decided to go by, by ourselves to check it out. What kind of status that they're going to have there. We went to Rwanda and we saw that uh, all the asylum seekers who left Israel to Rwanda uh, moved to Uganda a few days later. So we try to understand what is their situation in Uganda, uh, what are they doing there, if they have any possibility to work, do they stay in, in Uganda or do they move to other places. And uh, we saw a terrible situation that actually most of them cannot work legally. In April 2018, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu succumbed to local and international pressure by overturning the plan to deport 38,000 African migrants living in Israel. At a press conference in Tel Aviv, he admitted that the deportation scheme had actually been launched and executed, but later hit a snag due to local and international pressure. משום שבית המשפט הלכה למעשה אסר עלינו להוציא אותם למדינה שאינה מוכנה לקבל אותם, ללא הסכמתם. וכדי להתגבר על הבעיה הזאת היינו צריכים לחפש, וחיפשתי מדינה, ועמלתי על כך קשה מאוד, שתסכים לקבל את האנשים הללו בלי שהם יסכימו לעבור אליה. זו הייתה פריצת דרך, חשובה מאוד, נתנה לנו הרבה מאוד תקווה. התחלנו להוציא אנשים אליה. אבל מהר מאוד התברר שהמדינה השלישית הזאת איננה עומדת בתנאים, איננה עומדת בלחץ. ולכן מן הרגע שהתברר בשבועות האחרונים שהמדינה השלישית כאופציה לא קיימת, 
אנחנו למעשה נכנסנו למלכודת שאומרת שכולם היו נשארים. זה המשמעות. היינו מחכים לתשעה בחודש, לבג"ץ, והבג"ץ היה אומר לנו, אין לכם מדינה שלישית, ולפיכך, כולם, בלי יוצא מן הכלל, כ-35,000 איש, כולם נשארים. אתה לא יכול לעשות כלום. לא ויתרנו שוב. This implies that the status of Eritreans and South Sudan asylum seekers in Israel remains largely unchanged with the Israel government unable to push through with their official deportation, while on the other hand, deferring, regionalizing their stay. We know that after we came back, uh, the head of the um, um, department in the Minister of Interior Affairs traveled after us to the same countries. We know that the Supreme Court started to ask difficult questions to, to the government. So we know we made a change. Uh, at the end, they, um, I think what helped us is also that the Rwanda government decided not to go on with that agreement. Nine days after our visit, the government uh, uh, told uh, or sent a message to the Israeli government that they will not accept uh, refuge refugees or asylum seekers coming from Israel. In the meantime, the fate of asylum seekers who remain in Israel is still undetermined, with very slim chances of being granted asylum status. This implies that their dream of finding a safe place to live, work and enjoy basic human rights still hangs in balance. And as for those spirited away back to Africa under the cover of darkness, they continue to face a grim and uncertain future. Having already applied for asylum in Israel, they cannot be granted refugee status in a country in Africa. Without any identification of any sort, they are rendered stateless in the new country where they continue to live in the shadows. Out of desperation, the other option is to risk taking the perilous journey across the Mediterranean to Europe.